Hey, good evening, Orange Avenue family. Man, I gotta tell you this, I miss you all so much. I just miss being here in the auditorium, being able to study with you, being able to ask questions, and to just have great dialogue about God's word. But we're doing the most, or doing the best with what we've got. And uh, it is just so good to be able to connect with you at this level. I want to remind you, if you're just tuning in for the first time, that we've been talking about what it means to live resurrected lives. We've made two really big statements. The first one being, if the resurrection of Jesus can be, true, can be proven to be false, then Christianity and our faith would mean absolutely nothing. The second statement that we've made in our class is that if the resurrection can 100% with evidence, be known to be true, then that means that Christianity and our faith is the number one most important thing in the entire world. With those questions in mind, and with a study that we've done in the past about the case and the evidence for the resurrection, we have found out that with great evidence, the resurrection of Jesus can be known without a doubt to be a true historical event. What an awesome thing, right? Uh, but with that becomes a really big question. That question is this that we've been asking. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true, how does that change your life? We've looked at it through a couple of different lenses. We've looked at what it means to have a resurrected prayer life. We've looked at what it means to have a resurrected retirement life. We've looked at what it means to have a resurrected church life. And even more recently, we looked at what it means to have a resurrected life of boldness. Today, what I want to focus on is what it means to have a resurrected Bible study life. I don't know about you, but I am so happy that we have God's Word. I can't imagine a life where I was left to live without any instructions or without any direction. And of course, with uh, about 1,200 years of span time, and 40 different authors. It is so cool that the Bible, from Old Testament to New Testament, lives in direct agreement. It's a reliable book. I want to ask you to consider a few verses today, and I want to ask you to even then consider a different or new way of studying the Bible. Uh, in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, we know this, this scripture. It says, all scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What an awesome uh, identifier of God's word right there. And not, this is not made by just men who are writing, but the words that we have in scripture are breathed out. They are the, the words of God that are written on paper. And it's an awesome, awesome thing that we have. Not only is it just a collection, or is it a collection of words that are from God, but there's use to it. Uh, the Bible is so useful. It teaches us, gives us the things that we need to learn. It rebukes us when we need rebuking. It corrects us when we need correcting. And one of my favorite parts about the Bible, it trains us up for righteousness so that I, as a man dedicated to God, and for you as people dedicated to God, you can be thoroughly equipped for every good thing that God has for you. And the Bible is a special, special book. You remember in Psalm chapter one that it says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or, or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. I want to look at that little section of scriptures there for just a moment and talk about what does it mean to be that tree that is planted by streams of water? I don't know about you, but when we try to keep things alive at home, it doesn't work out that well all the time. I mean, like we need the plants that can survive on no water uh, or I guess they're fake plants. Uh, but if I try to do stuff out, outdoors, remembering to water plants is just not the best thing for me. And in times like right now where there's not a lot of rain, it's just really hard for me to keep things alive. But Psalm says that the man who delights and meditates on God's word is like a tree that is planted by streams of water. 
It is always getting the nutrients and the source of life that it needs. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And one thing that that tree that is planted by streams of water doesn't need is for somebody to come in and to water it. Why? Because where it, where it lives is the place that it needs to be. For you and I, what that looks like is that whenever we are, we are streams or, or we're, we're trees that are planted by streams of water, when we're that man who, who meditates on God's word day and night, when we, we, we are all about God's word, our lives are a lot less needy and dependent on other people to be telling us about God's word. Man, it's good to be together as God's people, and I miss you all, but I hope that not one person in this, in this church depends on me for your spiritual strength. I hope that all our kids in the youth group that none of them simply depend on Scott for all of their spiritual needs, but that we are people of the word who study, who dig deep, and are like that tree that are planted by streams of water. That's our goal. In Hebrews chapter four, uh, in verses 12 and 13, here's a, a scripture that you all know as well. It says, for the word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It, penetra it, it penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid before the eyes of him whom we must give an account. Church, I don't think there is any doubt that God's word is the most important book in the entire world. You and I have a great opportunity right now to be spending more time in it. You think about it, all of our distractions have been taken away. Well, most of them have. Uh, our children don't have some of the things that they're used to watching. I don't have sports to watch right now. And what am I going to fill my time with? What am I going to replace with the time I usually would have spent in front of one of the screens that I have why not God's word? So I want to ask you as a family, and you've seen it in, uh, in the family discussion guides that have been put out, but I want to make sure we are always reiterating that we can be studying the Bible together. So I want to ask you tonight, and you'll see it on the worksheet that is put with this lesson, will you study in the Discovery Bible Study Method? I want to walk through it with you real quick as a reminder, and again, it'll be on the worksheet, but will you as a family sit down and talk about God's word in a really big way. It's also a great way to read God's word on your own. They come on these little bookmarks and I just wanna walk you through it real quick. For instance, in the, in the passage that we read in Hebrews, chapter four, verses 12 through 13, we would simply read that, uh, that account and then we would uh, read it again and then we'd have someone retell what we just read, uh, just for comprehension's sake. Not a quoting of scripture, but someone just retelling what they thought it meant. For instance, if I were to try to retell Hebrews chapter four, I would just, I would retell it in a way that was pretty simple. That God's word is not dead. God's word is alive and God's word is active and it does something to us. It, uh, I remember it saying that it penetrates um, our soul or penetrates to divide our soul and spirit it, it does a lot and it uncovers everything before God. So I just know that God's word is a really, really powerful thing. There's some questions that the Discovery Bible Study Method will ask us to consider. And I want to first begin uh, by, by asking you this to, to think about tonight. What in your life are you grateful for? What is God doing and done in your life that is just going really, really well right now? What, have, what were your wins today? Where did things go right? And as you read the scripture that, that you're focusing on, here are the questions that you're gonna ask. The first one is this. What do I learn about God? What is it about him that, what, what part of his nature is revealed in what I just read? What do I learn about who he is and what he's doing? And a, a good follow-up question to that is this. Is that how I experience God? on a daily basis. 
I want you to discuss that and everyone gives their answer in your group that you're meeting with. The second question is this, what do I learn about me? What do I learn about mankind because of what I just read? And simply discuss that together as a family or as a small group that you're with. And now, now that we are learning about God, we're learning about what's being revealed about us, we're going to turn around and we're going to ask this question. What can I do this week to obey what I just read? Or how can I put this scripture into action? And that's one of the fun parts to talk about uh, where do we start to apply God's word? What does it look like for me this week in my context to really put this set of scriptures to work? It's talking about obedience. If you remember in the Great Commission, they were told to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey the commandments of God. That's a really cool thing. A lot of times we get stuck in just teaching the commandments of God, but we want to be focused in this kind of study on teaching people to obey the commandments of God. You know the difference. There's one thing of knowing what to do, and there's another thing on talking about and learning about and knowing and then acting on how to obey the things that we know we should do. The last question that we need to ask uh, in the discovery Bible study uh, method is this. Who in my life do I have the ability to share this message with? Based on what I learned about God, what I learned about man, and how I know I can obey, who can I tell this week? I'll tell you what, this method has been incredible for me as, as an individual. It has allowed me to work more on applying God's word. It has allowed me to work more on uh, the exegesis of God's word or, or drawing out the meaning that is really deep in there because I'm learning about God, I'm learning about my nature, and then I'm asking the question, how can I obey? But even more so, when I, when I ask myself the question, who in my life needs to hear this message? It is calling me towards the Great Commission in a much greater way. I want to ask you this, because uh, the last one that is on there is this. Uh, how can we help with a challenge that you're, that you're facing right now? Or what can we be praying about? You know, Orange Avenue, that we are a praying congregation. In the next few days, you're going to see roll out a, a prayer challenge for the month of April. We want to know what to be praying for. So you can call the office, you can email me, hit me up on Facebook, I want to know what we can be praying about for you as a congregation. But here's the big deal uh, with our lesson tonight. There are many of us that have had a dead Bible study life. There are many of us that sometimes we remember, sometimes we don't. And even when we do, we simply just read some scriptures. We check a box because that's what we were supposed to read today. Or we just read some scriptures and then we don't do anything about it. But we know that in the book of James, we're reminded that the man who looks intently into the law of the Lord and then does what it says, man, that's the one who's on the right track. So my question for you today is, are you willing to submit to God your Bible study life so that it can be resurrected? Let's pray together and the lesson will be yours for tonight. Our Father in heaven, we love you so incredibly much. We thank you for the gift of your word the gift of the Bible that you've given us so that you haven't left us alone. Uh, God, we just, we want to be people who are under its authority. We want to pe pe be people who, uh, who read what you say and we mold and shape our lives around your commandments and your examples. So God, help us, uh, every one of us, from the preachers to the elders to the youth minister to, to, uh, to everyone who is here at this congregation, to submit our study lives to you in a greater way so that they can be resurrected, so that we can be people of your word who not only read it, but we apply it and then we share it. We love you, God. We pray this all in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.